yes yes we okay excellent so let seems to work excellent so let's hope my internet uh stay stable so first of all thank uh cpe for inviting me to this very special event in honor of l campbell and i try to talk about a topic i haven't talked for a long time in honor of l on trying to focus on transistors, charge transport. So also people know that I'm not a physicist as Elle was, but I'm a material scientist. So I give a bit of a view from material science. And I call this presentation polymer optoelectronics challenges and opportunities. A lot of the work of course had started at Imperial College London, many things. I do now continue here at Georgia Tech. And if there's time, I may also talk about beyond. We heard about cavities, photonics, topics that I'm really very interested in. But this is my first online live talk since like one year. I only had recorded talks, so I have no clue how my timekeeping will be. So I may have to stop earlier. Clearly, because it's still a work starting at Imperial College, I really would thank a lot of the people, and this is absolutely not a complete list, my collaborators during the years with, of course, uh, L, uh, who we often discussed in the pub, where else, international collaborators, as well as now here in London, and I just uh, listed a few, PhD students and collaborators, Carlos Silva, many of you know him, who is also co-director of COPE together with me. And because it's a CPE event, I thought I will actually steal a graphic that we used for one of our DTC applications that really nicely shows how solution processed electronics and photonics can affect our world and really showing it's a growth area. We heard about photonics and displays and lighting just in the previous talk of Frankie So, Large area electronics where L was very much active with upscaling of manufacturing sensors and bioelectronics. Indeed, I think Alistair and as we heard from Donald Bradley touched a lot of those different themes from textiles, bioelectronics, security, and he worked on processing, upscaling, and the photophysical and electrical transport properties, which I would like to focus on. So really, in case we think of frontier topics in the broader uh, polymer solution processable electronics field, we can use photonics, energy generation, solar cells, and I'm sure we hear more about it in some of the later talk, bioelectronics, a lot of yesterday's talk, day was devoted to it, and electronics. And because this is really dedicated to Alistair, I would like to focus on electronics, where I walk a bit on thin lines because I'm a material scientist. I like to talk about device stability, and really uh, about traps where Alistair, together with Donald Bradley, uh, when he was still in Sheffield, did a lot of work to understand traps in organic systems. Mm -hmm. Those who know me know that I like polyethylene. So uh, it's the commodity polymer. And very early on with Christian Müller, oops, hello, there was supposed to be a P3HD. We made plans with a semiconducting polymers such as P3HD. So indeed, we used the semiconductor and added different types of polyethylene into the semiconductor from high density to ultra low density polyethylene. So varying degree of crystallinity. And when you used the a transistor, which I know all of you know, a three terminal device, where we can manipulate the amount of charge carriers here in the blue semiconducting layer, which here is a blend via the gate bias. And we learn about the device performance from the source strain current, there we can deduce the mobility. So essentially the capability of charges to move and how fast they move. So that's plotted here on the y-axis. So what you see is, again, Really, uh, 15 years ago, we showed that we can add a lot of polyethylene 
to the P3HG and still get essentially identical devices like P3HG. Processing, something that Elle was very uh, interested in, is thereby important. A phase diagram is shown here where we plot crystallization temperature uh, of here a copolymer, it could be a blend of P3HG and polyethylene, ink xylene. We plot the crystallization temperature here in blue triangles. I'm not sure if my cursor shows up. And in red circles, the crystallization temperature of P3HG. And what it tells us is processing. Uh, important if you want to print, for instance, as L did. So it shows us that usual methodologies where you would first crystal, just evaporate the solvent, you would crystallize polyethylene first, not very useful because then the P3HG is the semiconductor, can't really order. However, if in case we cast at higher temperatures, we can crystallize the P3HG first and only then the, the polyethylene. So that re really leads to those transistors, but also bulk charge transport. Uh, despite we have loads of insulator in there. And of course, we gain mechanical toughness because the polyethylenes, we can easily get to high molecular weight, etc. But this is an old story. So more and more, we started to look into the stability uh, of such blends. Uh, the reason is if you take many, well, most of our organic semiconductors and expose them to air. So here is a sample for eight hours you start to see this uh, feature at the transistors. So here we plot the source drain current of the transistor on the y-axis versus the gate bias, so the bias that allows you to control how many charge carriers you have in there. So therefore, the higher the, the gate bias, the more current you have because you have more charge carriers. But you see, when you expose the, ma the material, the device to air, you get here this double shape very early on seen by Dajo Di Leo, um, which is uh, uh, which Dajo attributed to doping uh, and actually air and light of the, uh, introduced by air and light in the semiconductor. Interestingly, when we made the blends with polyethylene of the same semiconductor, we do not have that. And that's surprising, in my opinion at least because polyethylene is actually not a material known for a good oxygen barrier. So that's why we have Coke and being in Atlanta, I have to talk, talk about Coca-Cola, I guess, uh, in PET bottles with 16 layers, uh, packaging, including silicon dioxide, etc. So despite we make a blend with something that is not a good oxygen barrier, you see, the device is much, much less sensitive to um, the exposure to oxygen. We know that this uh, um, degradation here in the, uh, in the neat material is not chemical degradation. It's reversible. If you put the device into vacuum and dark, it will recover. So one question we asked ourselves is adding the polyethylene, does that help us simply to reduce traps? Because polyethylene is very hydrophobic. So we do not get, for instance, humidity into the material. So rather than using P3HG, which everybody knows I love, and then comes PBTDT uh, in honor of Martin Heaney, but at this time uh, we use DBPTTT, which is this structure still pretty heavy on thiophenes, I must say. So I was still sticking a bit to my materials. We used it because TBTTT is really known to be a pretty good um, transistor material. And now you see what happens when we make a blend. Again, so here we have a transistor characteristic. We use a top contact bottom gate uh, configuration. Very used blends of different polyethylene content. You see DPTTT by itself, so that's the black line. It's actually not a bad device at all. However, when we, we blend, and we're not the first ones to see that, uh, so that very early on in blend with polystyrene, I think, we do shift the threshold voltage, meaning the device is off over here, turns on, and essentially that 
where it turns on, we call the threshold voltage. And what is nice by adding the polyethylene, we get a threshold voltage that is essentially zero uh, volt, which is nice in case you want to produce integrated circuits. Um, we also see an effect in the sub-threshold slope. So that's really how fast do we go from off to on. So how many, uh, so it's really the, the slope of here, this racing, uh, whatever, uh, current. So when we plot the, the threshold voltage and the sub-threshold slope, you see in both cases, when we add polyethylene, the threshold voltage really goes closer and closer to zero volt and we also reduce the sub threshold slope mini uh, which is given here as millivolts per decade really essentially how many volts we need or millivolts to get uh, to uh, 10 times more current so the lower this number the steeper is the sub threshold slope which is wanted because that means you can uh, switch on and off your device faster so now to uh, L and his work on traps. So we can relate directly the subthreshold uh, slope with the trap density. So here we have a formula of the trap density that relates directly to the subthreshold slope. And then we have uh, parameters of well, elementary parameters and some device parameters like the dielectric capacitance. So what we see here now, if we uh, calculate the trap density in our blends, we see that uh, the neat material has relatively high number of um, traps given here at uh, as one over electrovolt square centimeters times 10 times 12. But the more and more polyethylene we uh, add, especially around 50% and 75-8% of polyethylene, we massively reduce those traps. So we went on further and looked, focusing on the blend where we saw the lowest trap density. What's going on? Can we use that actually, for instance, with a uh, reduction of bias stress? So bias stress is uh, very undesirable in devices, which means in case you apply a constant stress, the material, the device actually shifts its performance over time. So here we use the constant bias stress of 20 volts over 10,000 seconds at the source strain uh, voltage of minus one. And you see during this constant bias stress, need DVT-DT shifts uh, threshold voltage, as well as also the sub-threshold slope is a bit affected, which we attribute to trap states that are in the device. However, when we actually add the polyethylene, so again, here we use the one-to-one -one, uh, mixture where we had the lowest amount of uh, traps, we massively reduce this bias stress. Why is this important? Again, this is very unwanted for integration, device integration, because you have to design, let's say, inverters, ring oscillators based on characteristics like sub-threshold, uh, such as uh, threshold voltage and sub-threshold voltage. So if you design your circuit for a device here, like in the black line, but then over time it gets to one of those yellow lines, your ring oscillators will not work as well anymore. Clearly we have that a bit in the blends too, but it is massively reduced. What is intriguing is when we take this data, uh, and that's maybe uh, for researchers, at the beginning, it's actually not so bad for both devices. So here we just plot the, the shift in sub-threshold volt over time. And you see, if you just look at uh, a bit of stressing, there's not big differences but the big difference really comes over longer term usage of the device. Blending also helps with electron transporting materials. So here I actually forgot the chemical structure, a typical prototypical uh, electron transporting material N2200, 
where you see here we didn't do stress, we just exposed it at air and measured the devices every five minutes. So here we have again a transfer characteristics, uh, source strain current versus VG. And you see at the beginning, we have a beautiful N22 device, so the beginning in black, but after air exposure, you drastically see the threshold, uh, the volt threshold voltage shift, lower currents, and this characteristic bump uh, when we expose organic semiconductors to air in transistors. However, when we actually now add the polyethylene, this is not the case, which as before, we believe has to do that with the polyethylene, likely because it's a very good moisture barrier, it uh, helps reducing the traps. But the full mechanism, I have to say, we are really not fully sure yet. What is really cool and surprised me, I have to say, this approach is very versatile. So we can, for instance, use it for organic electrochemical transistors, where I, I'm sure you heard quite a bit about uh, yesterday. So we, are, we essentially have like a transistor, but the gate is uh, given with an electrolyte. So here you have again source strain current. I think that should be the gate bias. So the G got somehow lost here. What you see here is um, we often have problems with the OECTs because they have a large hysteresis. So here we measure a device, the current goes up because we create more charges. But because here we rely also on ions moving, you see we have a pretty strong hysteresis. It's also very much dependent, uh, and I have to say the field doesn't really talk too much about it, how fast you measure. So you have to really go slow to get high, higher currents and smaller hysteresis. As soon as you go faster, actually this, um, you will actually not be able to really turn on your device. And here I have to say our active material was a P3HG copolymer with P3HG uh, high, substituted, the side chains being substituted, functionalized with hydroxyl groups, so OH groups. So this part, the P3HHG is essentially P3HG with every few side chains having alcohol groups at the end, making it polar and allowing therefore ion transport. You see that uh, this uh, hysteresis, you can reduce a bit if you go to from larger scales, which simply means like vacuum evaporated electrodes. So you have channel uh, lengths of 50 microns to micro pattern OECTs where you have smaller channel lengths, then this effect is not so bad. Uh, not everybody has in the lab usually the facilities. Now, when we do the blending, and here we didn't use polyethylene, we need to get ions in into the device. So here we added a block copolymer. So we have a copolymer, a random copolymer as active layer, as ion, a mixed conductor, electron ion mixed conductor. We added uh, a component, P3HG, that should like, of course, the segments, the P3G segments here, plus some polyethylene oxide uh, insulating uh, commodity polymer that is the node to, for, to ion conduct. And you see the massive effect. Adding 25% of this additive, you reduce the hysteresis. And even for the rough patterned OECTs, you see this is the case. So we really can actually prevent large-scale hysteresis and in the next measurement of the devices, pretty independent actually of the rate that you use. So you really can actually measure the devices very, very fast uh, without compromising the device with respect to a uh, large hysteresis. And I think actually I'm nearly there with time. I wanted to talk a bit also about uh, blends in organic, fo um, uh, organic photovoltaics, but in view of time, let me end if I can get there. Oops. So I hope I could show just with blending, we can address a lot of those um, 
activities in the organic and solution processed electronics, photonics world, from processing, allowing photophysics because we can get more reliable um, devices, and also op opening up really uh, pathways to upscaling and manufacturing. Clearly, these were topics that was very much at heart to L science, and it was always amazing to actually discuss with him, uh, learn, especially for me as material scientists, lear learn about the photophysics. And it's such a shame that indeed, actually here in Atlanta, we can go to the pub. Uh, I, I'm not sure now what, what the situation is in the UK, but I hope uh, we all will uh, keep fingers crossed for the Swiss game. I may actually need to sneak out at the end of uh, the second session to simply say hope sweets. And in case there's time, I'm glad to answer them. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, awesome talk. Uh, th there is uh, there is some time for, for questions. So uh, even though it was live, it was perfectly timed. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question uh, in the chat here. Um, did you also investigate whether your blending approach affects device stability at elevated temperatures? This is from Sven Giebel. Okay, that's a very good question. We did a bit uh, at the very early times with Christian Müller. So that was still the 2005 paper. Uh, it actually helps to a certain extent. Clearly here using polyethylene is not the best choice because polyethylene melts at 130, 135 degrees C. So it helps with some temperature stability, but if you go too close to the melting of polyethylene, you get phase separation, etc. That actually would have been the next part of my talk that I now left out. Clearly, you can circumvent that. So we actually never published it. You can use, for instance, instead of polyethylene, you could can use polypropylene, which acts very similar. I mean, polypropylene is just a larger brother of polyethylene. So it has a bit of 